A lot of good techniques. All right, we're on. We're back on. All right, so here's the here's the good news. We have. Are you ready? Like three more laps, right? We got this week, next week. We come back, and then the, so it's like three more laps in the final. And one of those labs, and, and we really need the time. So what I'm gonna, what I did, remember I might, we were, I, we talked about me running those things. Let me show you. Look what I ran. So I'm, we're gonna do a take-home style. See, and you, and obviously, even though it's, it's sometimes hard to arrange them, you obviously you can, you can flip these to do them easily enough. But yeah, I, if I, I could flip them and I'm not going to, so you can flip them or you could sort of do this. So I will send that to you. So I'm going to bring in the, in the lab. I will have the Scantrons. I think there's only 19 because it was about all the illustrations I wanted to use, but I will attach and send it to this to you this afternoon and you can deliver them to me a week from, week from today. Fair enough? There you go. See, let's see what else you could come up with. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll make any like after the lecture can be a bit. Oh, God. Here, everybody's just, you're awful. What? Again, I still haven't figured out how you stay so slender. I went to the gym today for like two hours this morning. That's my daughter in a nutshell. We went out, we, Thursday I was not here because I had an opportunity to meet with my son who drove up from Norfolk only to drive back down to Norfolk that day. So he met for an hour and a half. And my daughter walks into this, it's called, what's it, the, the Loft, it's in Oakmont. Anybody know it? Above my pay grade. Okay. Thankfully he's, 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 my son's got money. So my daughter walks in and the first thing, here are these very, as you might guess, very attractive people for uh, bringing us in at lunch, hostesses. And the first thing they look at my daughter's nails and goes, oh, let me see your nails. Oh, I just got them done. That's what I have to do. She went to work when she was 15 at McDonald's in Harmerville. And what did she do with her first? I said, what are you going to do with your first paycheck? All of like $30. Oh, dad, I'm going to get my nails done. In a nutshell. I don't get my nails. It, it, you're not her. You, just said that you remind me of her, but you're not her. You're not dating anybody who's 60 years or older. She's got the website. Not anymore. She said. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> I hear you're interested in that. It's like, it's, it's, I think it's sugardaddies.com. <laughs> she dated one guy I had more in common with. Honest to goodness, we had a con I'm sitting here in a conversation with William Penn, and who grew up in the same neck of the woods. He was from Long Island, he was a cardiologist. We, we all the same kind. I don't know what she used to want. Crazy. Oh, yeah. Sorry. And I found out that for you women's hockey fans here for RMU, that the coach was my was her fiance's roommate when they both played hockey together. So whoever I forget what the, what his name is. I was gonna I was gonna shoot him an email and mention that. But Sean, her boyfriend, and they were roommates on the. An RMU's hockey team. I think they graduated no fun. So, so much for the introductory material. Let us on with the liver. Here it comes. Liver. Liver is an interesting organ, gland, whatever you want to call it. You know, in the old days, we say it was the largest gland, and I don't know if that makes a damn bit of difference. But these are the really the principal accessory organs, and the least important of those, though the most troublesome sometimes, is the gallbladder. We'll get to that as well. And the liver is just so vital. We I say this all the time. We underestimate the extraordinary importance of the liver. 
how easily it is damaged, and when it doesn't work, everything it just just. If you've ever seen anybody on the transplant list waiting for a liver, they don't look good. And it does, and it's not confined to people who are alcoholics or people who have mass, you know, contracted hepatitis by some, you know, by, by IV drug use or things like that. My first cousin who I think was, you know, was, we were about the same age. She was just two years younger than I. Her first husband died at age 28 when they already had two kids, and he, she, was, he, she was pregnant with number three. And it was about 1980, uh, 80, 81, when they first started the liver transplants here with Dr. Starzl, and it became a transplant center. And he died on the transplant list. I mean, she called me and was asking about places to stay in Pittsburgh, things along those lines, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, about a week later, gone. So 28 years old, not a drug user or anything like that, just some hereditary or environmental, some type of contamination to his liver when he was a kid. That's it. So moving on. So the big play it does with regard to digestion is fats. If fats, again, we don't have hydrolysis for bonds and fats. Fats aren't bonded together, they just naturally come together, water soluble and fat soluble. So you, we all know that about fats, they congeal, they come together, whether it's salad dressing, whether it's gravy from the turkey, or any of that stuff. We always see it. And so you have to have something that can get in the way, effectively something that's bipolar, to separate fats. And that's where bile comes in. It's an emulsifying agent. So it breaks down the fats into components that can mix with water and be excreted and or processed the gallbladder is me it, it, the best analogy for the gallbladder is like your overflow tank for antifreezing and coolant in your car you have a line coming in and a line going out and effectively that's what so it's a temporary does it concentrate it yeah a little bit but frankly it's more problems than it's worth uh with regard to with particularly people who are prone to gallstones more on that later the pan and, and the gallbladder is not vital it's not essential they can be removed your liver can function fine without them and they're removed with some relative degree of frequency and the pancreas on the other hand is not pancreas is as important for you can't exist without it we can't replace it it is a very very important glandular structure because of all the enzymes for digestion and certainly insulin and glucagon all of which we will get to these are the uh, the endocrine part of the program. Looking at the liver, largest gland, they're calling it a gland in the body. It predominates the abdominal cavity. It's massive compared to the other organs if you look at it. Technically speaking, it's divided in lobes in classical anatomy. They mean absolutely nothing. The dividing has to do with what they call ligaments. And even they know it's a false ligament. It's not an analogous to a ligament that holds bone to bone. It's not made of the same kind of tissue. It's really folds of peritoneum that have caused what appear to be divides in the substance of the liver. So the ligament is a false ligament, hence they call it falsiform. And it separates into lobes. Yes, it plays a role in suspending it. There's another ligament, round or circular, means teres. We see that name a lot. And it's a remnant of the fetal umbilical vein. So it's, again, another false, basically false ligament. So I don't really care about them. But you can see what it looks like here. And the reason I mention this to you, you can see the gallbladder is somewhat, is in, hangs inferiorly from the interior or inferior, or what we call the volar surface, sort of the undersurface of the liver as you're looking at this way. And you can see the divide. But the reality is, that any liver, whether it's here, 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 down here at the point, if you take a sample, it reflects what's going on in the liver. And that's something we do with some degree of frequency medically. I mean, if someone has liver problems, the diagnostic criteria is a liver biopsy. You can do it, you can decide a lot with blood tests, but the liver biopsy helps you specifically identify where the problem is. Okay, and it doesn't matter where you take it because it all looks the same. So the liver is very much of a repetitive structure. And we used to, yes, sir? Isn't like, uh, it's like degenerate? Yes, very much. It's one of the, one of the it's as arguably the most regenerative organ that we have. That's why we don't do as many liver transplants 
because now we know that liver will regenerate to a certain extent. And so now you can even do live liver transplants with suitable donors. Not that I understand it. And interestingly, much of the work was certainly pioneered here at the Starzl Institute. We, he, Dr. Starzl came from Denver, uh, again, right around 1980. And all of a sudden, UPMC, whatever it was called then, because he was basically working at Presby at the time, became the transplant center. You know, pioneered a lot of the transplant. Yeah, well, we had a lot of really groundbreaking doctors there. Freddie Fu died relatively recently. Pioneer in sports medicine. He operated my daughter at well, least many years ago, 25 years ago or so. If you, uh, if you took a piece off the liver, would you, would you have like two viable liver? I don't, short answer, I don't know, but the likelihood is yes. I mean, I, I think so. As long as you had adequate blood supply and venous drainage, you would think that would be true. Short answer, I don't know. This is that undersurface, the indentation, hilum area. There's a big sulcus, an indentation for the vena cava that sits there. And you're going to see what feeds into that from the liver. Remember, what feeds into the liver is a vein with all the blood from your digestive tract. You remember that in circulation called the hepatic portal vein. What that feeds the blood in to be processed and it goes through a capillary bed. So and again, a portal vein goes from capillary bed to capillary bed because normally it's vein. It's arteries, capillary bed, veins, and then finally back we flip around to the heart. Here we have in succession capillary beds with venous blood. It just so happens that this one processes the blood and it exits by way of, as you will see, called the hepatic vein and feeds into the vena cava. And here you can see the gallbladder and the undersurface and hanging down. It usually has a, it's a distinctive texture and color comparatively. Again, the lesser omentum, those folds of visceral peritoneum, anchor it to the stomach along that lesser curvature. And at what's called the porta hepatis, that's the entry point for the hepatic artery. Also, the entry, and remember, there's more, multiple things entering. You have the hepatic artery, you have the portal vein. And you have exit points for the hepatic veins going to the vena cava after the bud's processed, and for bile ducts, for exit points for bile, which are going to basically travel either to the gallbladder or directly to the small intestine. So it's a very busily trafficked area and extraordinarily important. And you'll see these structures. You're going to see the bile ducts, the hepatic duct leaves the liver, the cystic duct is that sort of overflow to the gallbladder, and then yet another bile duct you were going to see, and there's like a, where these ducts kind of come, come together from the gallbladder as well as from the liver. And so you can see it a little bit here. Here's that porta hepatis. The portal vein enters, the hepatic artery enters, the common hepatic duct exits. Farther along, but still along that sulcus, that indentation, you have the exit points for hepatic vein, and then they join the indentation mostly is made by the giant inferior vena cava. And so this is the undersurface of the, uh, the particular portion of the liver we're looking at. So you can see it enters here, divides, goes to the respective lobar, lobar areas, is processed, and then once, it's, once the blood is processed, it effectively cleansed it is, comes back by way of the hepatic veins into the vena cava. Any part of the liver is divided into what are called lobules. Lobes are those big sections, but the lobules are more or less microscopic and they're very hexagonal. And they're really the, the structure and functional unit. And all they have are plates of identical liver cells are liver cells. They all look the same, okay? and. They all feed, in, and you'll have to see it, the illustration really helps. They feed from outside to inside. They feed from the four to six points of the hexagon and basically, and I use the term a lot, percolate through the liver with this blood that's rich in nutrients and rich in materials and potentially rich in invaders and goes through the liver and is processed. It's cleared, it's detoxified, it's broken down. It's made into proteins, da, 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 clotting factors, you name it, the liver does it. And then in it goes 
into the vena cava by way of the hepatic vein and gets circulated to where it's supposed to be. As it goes, and the central veins of each of these lobules eventually form the hepatic veins. So we look at the triad at each of the six corners of that lobule, a tiny branch of the hepatic artery, a branch of the hepatic portal vein, and a bile duct receiving bile that's processed flowing in the opposite direction. It's not flowing from the points from peripheral to central. The bile is, if anything, is flowing from central out to the periphery. So it's kind of, it's a two-way flow in that regard. So this is what they look like. It's a liver biopsy. It's normal. If you see irregularities where this hexagon is distorted, the more of those you see, the more liver disease there is. If there's some, it may just be signs of early signs of hepatitis. If it's grossly deformed, it will lead to cirrhosis or fibrosis and dysfunctional livers. And surely, again, the most common reason why people have dysfunctionality in the liver, less so than you would think infection or disease entities, much more so, you know, so be the number one. Very interesting, because I mean, so I used to do a course years ago when I first started teaching, a good 25 years ago, on, uh, I started teaching a course in addictive diseases. Very, very, very interesting. And, and just, uh, perhaps more so than, a lot of experts, even more so than smoking, or most, or more so than things like cocaine usage, even crack cocaine, which is an inhaled cocaine form, Alcohol is, is, is there are just so many terrible recurrences. And uh, unfortunately, the detoxification process is potentially fatal. So a lot of people don't understand. And so there's a lot that goes on with, with, with detox units in that regard. I worked in a hospital that had a very large drug and alcohol detox unit in, in North Philly when I was a resident. So here's a classic lobule, and you can see... Here's that central vein, and everything kind of comes in from the corners of the hexagon, so to speak. And as I said, it goes through these ramps of cells. We call them liver sinusoids. Remember, sinusoidal capillaries have wide openings. Stuff can get through fairly easily. It has a ton of macrophages, different kinds of antigen-presenting cells, particularly as well as little sweepers to clean up debris. And so it's a really good illustration. Here's the triad. The bile duct, but it's coming this way because each of these tiny hepatocytes, these walls of hepatocytes, produce bile. The bile is collected and flows out while the artery feeds the cell so they can process the venous blood, which feeds in and central to this, again, this central vein, which eventually feeds into a, from the lobular veins to lobar veins and eventually form the hepatic vein. So the portal vein eventually leads in and forms out by the hepatic vein. It's a little confusing. There's a lot of endoplasmic reticulum, but interestingly, more smooth than rough. So if you go back to cell 101, smooth endoplasmic reticulum is about fats. It's about detoxification. And yes, it's about little wells for calcium and things like that that we'll all get to. When you see cells that are rich in rough endoplasmic reticulum, they're basically making proteins mostly for export. So the pancreas would be different, making insulin and glucagon that's going to expel by way of the endocrine system or in, in some way, shape, or form. So the hepatocytes make the better part of a liter of bile per day. One of the few areas you can store carbohydrates is glycogen, plasma proteins, fat-soluble vitamin storage, detoxification, and certainly the, understand that dietarily, the big player is, and this is the big problem that we have when it comes to waste products, nitrogenous waste removals. We can get rid of, we can process out carbohydrates, we can process out fats, but when we have things that have nitrogen, and so one form of nitrogenous waste comes from the abundance of proteins in our diet. Because what do we do with an amino acid? Basically, we deaminate it as the first step. And then we reaminate it if we're going to recreate amino acids. When you deaminate, it makes ammonia. That NH2 rapidly becomes NH3. And ammonia sucks. 
So we have a wonderful way of dealing with this, and I'm sure you've seen it. It's 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 it's, it's absolute brilliance. So we take here's ammonia. And now we end up with this. When we make we add that to two carbon dioxides, look what we get. So we I'd rather we get I, we add two ammonias to one CO2, and we magically get this C double bond O NH2 NH2. So we can take two ammonias and make them into one urea, which is about a hundred times less toxic. And it's more water soluble, and we can ship it down to the kidney and expel it in urine. Brilliant. Take a naturally occurring waste product like carbon dioxide and use it for transport and minimize the toxicity. The other one we have to deal with comes from purines. So remember purines, adenine, and guanine. Okay, when we metabolize those down, we make uric acid. That's tough to deal with as well. It's another thing we can excrete that we can tolerate a little bit more of in our blood sugar. So I, it's, it's a nitrogenous waste material. I always think it's job one for the kidney. Okay, the kidney does a lot of stuff, but nitrogenous waste. And we get to this, just to sort of an intro, what we talk about in the physiology part of the program. So it's not da 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 Biome. So it's part of what's called the enterohepatic. We recycle the bile. About 95% of it we reuse. Very efficient. Okay. Yellow, green, alkaline. Bile salts are derived from cholesterol. Okay. And the pigment also becomes part of it from the heme called bilirubin. So, and that gets broken down to effectively excrete and colors our urine and feces as either stercobilin or urobilin, we get down to that, okay? And so there's a lot that's in bile as well as cholesterol and other fats that are part of it, electrolytes. So there's a lot that's in there, but this we recycle. It's one of the really good uses. Cholesterol is important, particularly for things like this. And interestingly, we recycle it. It's called the enterohepatic circulation, conserves the bile salts. So they enter by way, as you will see, of what's called the common bile duct, the vast, vast majority, which is the union of the bile coming from the liver and the secretions coming from the pancreas. And they come together now, we call it the hepatopancreatic ampulla and hepatopancreatic duct. But forever and a day, it's good. People will know it's the common bile duct. And that bile, once it's utilized as a, the bile salts particularly, once it is satisfactorily utilized as an, emul an emulsifying agent for fats, being, you, being broken down in the bloodstream, okay, is reabsorbed in the small intestine at the very end called the ilia. The small intestine has three components that are very much identical in appearance with some subtle differences, most notably the duodenum or duodenum, depending on how you pronounce it the entryway of the common bile duct, then you have the jejunum and the ileum. So at the ileum, it gets returned back by this enterohepatic circulation and then basically reformed. So we conserve it. So they're recycled, so we only have to make new about five years ago. When they started making cholesterol medicines, they tampered with this. So they basically was trying to get rid of more cholesterol. Good news, okay, for some people. Bad news is it caused, it overtaxed the liver. So the modern, when you hear somebody's on Atervastin, okay, Lipitor, and, and if you get to my age, every doctor went, oh, you're about to be on Lipitor. Gave me a headache. I stopped taking it. So, but it, it, that, and that works. It doesn't utilize this pathway because they had a lot of problems with the early, uh, you know, med medications. It's okay. Just try not to hurt yourself. Here, and this is it. So just, you can just, you don't have to go through it in detail, but it enters here, processes, and then it's picked up at toward the end of the ileum and brought back to the liver to recycle. Bad stuff that happens. Hepatitis, typically viral, 
poison mushrooms. A lot of drugs can do this. There's a lot of things that can, and there's, there's many different forms of hepatitis. We talk a lot about A, B, and C. There's other letters. For whatever reason, the hepatitis viruses, we talk more about in that. Hepatitis A, very important today, okay, because of what happened, oh, well, these 20 years ago, almost exactly today, Cheechins, which was a chain up in Beaver Falls, was the source of an infection that affected about 1,000 people and killed four. If you don't remember it, look it up. It was just in the paper. I first started teaching micro when that happened. What a great teaching example that was. So that's hepatitis A and hepatitis B. And then the one that really troubles us today is hepatitis C because most people are immunized for hepatitis B. But there is not one for hepatitis C. So, and that's another reason. And, you, and if, you're, if you're interested in foraging for mushrooms, know what the heck you're doing. Because there aren't a lot of people who know what they're doing. People, only people who know what they're doing should be using, consuming mushrooms. If you find them, Take a picture, send it to the Mushroom Society. There's a very active chapter in Western Pennsylvania. We've gone on mushroom, like, looks with these folks. They know what they're doing. Okay? Like, you know, in the spring, you look for something called morels, which are very tasty and very expensive. Just saying, no fans of mushrooms? Hey, I have shiitakes. Oh, yeah, happy days. What? I don't like the texture. Oh. Uh, uh, I could convince you. Oh. You can get dried shiitakes at Asian markets easy and reconstitute them. You can get uh, por porcinis. Oh. Oh. Stop toying with my emotion. Oh, oh. See, to me, that's like, it's, it's, it's like when you're making something like, if you're making scal Marsala scallopinis, you got to have mushrooms. Just, just part of it. Love to make that. Just... So, and this is what happens, livers become inflamed, then as they deteriorate, they get replaced by fatty tissue, and at that point, you end up with big problems. So livers can, as you can see, livers can regenerate in 6 to 12 months, even after something like an 80% removal. Uh, yeah, boss. I'm sorry, I should turn that off. The big chief. The, the big cheese, yes. The boss. Hi, hey, it's okay. The gallbladder. Not a whole lot to say. Under surface of the liver, concentrates and stores bile. And the trouble is, it's got very much like nooks and crannies, like bones have and other structures have. So that honeycomb pattern is a problem. Okay, even though it has a lot of surface area, the tr and it, even though it does play a role in concentrating the bile, certain times things get stuck. And the trouble, and that's a significant issue, much more so for women than for men. Who can affect both. Okay, there's a lot of risk factors for gallstones. It favors women. Yeah, we see a lot of it who are particularly exacerbated by folks who are heavier than lighter, folks who have, uh, during pregnancy, it can be a problem. So these are all things that play a role. Example, significant example, my, both of my eldest two children are products of IVF, in vitro fertilization. So my daughter-in-law went through, a, there's a whole lot of fertility meds that are all fat cholesterol based. It's a big problem. Her gallbladder went crazy when the first, when my granddaughter was born, my younger granddaughter, she ended up having to have her gallbladder removed almost immediately post-pregnancy. Big, big problem. 
So that was a very difficult birth. She lost a lot of blood. She was preeclamptic, which ain't good whatsoever. They nearly lost her. And then subsequently, because of the IVF and what they use to basically uh, facilitate uh, the fertility, and that was the second unit for IVF because the first unit didn't work. Uh, she ended up losing her gallbladder because of it. Just to give you an idea. So, and they're called calculi is another name for stones. We'll talk about them in the kidney as well. Over cholesterol, or in this case, the medications. Too few bile salts can be obstructive. The crystal crystals are interesting. Remember, we talked a little bit about gout. Okay, gout crystals, certain crystals, they're not innocuous. They form sharp spicules, and that contributes to their nastiness that are there. And because it blocks it, a lot of bad things can happen. Jaundice is anything that blocks the flow of bile almost anywhere along the tree. So it can block it at the gallbladder. It can, it can back it up into the liver and goes into the bloodstream. And you get that yellowish kind of a cast that, we, that has to do with bile blacking up. That's what we call jaundice. It can happen for a lot of things that are there. My middle one was born with that. And a lot of kids are from ABO incompatibility, but they are able to get rid of it with ultraviolet light to break it apart in neonates. Just to give you some idea. So it can clog, clog it there. It can clog it at the pancreatic level at the common bile duct level, it can cause enlargement of the pancreas or something called a pseudocyst. There's a lot of bad stuff that can happen. And certainly liver failure is amongst it. And so there's a lot of medications that can be used, surgery if necessary. They do use a lot of, they use this for kidney as well. It's called lithotripsy. You're basically using high frequency targeted sound waves, <coughs> which are non-invasive in that sense, non-surgical in that sense put people basically in a, in a large water bath or a water tank and the sound travels better in water than it does in the air. That's how, and so they use that a lot for lithotripsy, both for gallbladder and particularly for kidney stones. All done there. So you can remove that if necessary and sometimes it has to be. It's done today more frequently laparoscopically so it's a little less invasive. I don't know that it's necessarily heals better. Not my area of expertise. But it's not as big as an open surgical procedure, certainly. The pancreas, retroperitoneal, underneath the stomach. The head is surrounded by the duodenum. It's, it has a sort of an elongated tail. It's a double duty gland, exocrine for digestive, endocrine for glucagon and insulin. That's really the part that interests us perhaps even more. And so that's the best way to describe it. It is essential. You cannot do without it. And so this is typical. If you can think external to this area, on the exterior of this, if you can look at the cursor and take a look at where you would find the endocrine portion on the exterior, the interior are ducted or exocrine glands. They have, again, they're rich in endoplasmic reticulum. They're rich in rough endoplasmic reticulum. They are rich in mitochondria because they are very busy. <clears throat> and they're making what effectively, collectively called cymogens, which are enzymes in their inactive form or ogen form. Because you would, when someone has pancreatitis, it's horrible. They auto digest. Basically, these enzymes ooze out and they ain't picky. If it digests proteins, it digests any proteins. And considering your organs are all made out of proteins, you auto digest. That's one of the big problems with things like pancreatitis. And so that's what happened. And I, perhaps I shared that with you already. My first wife had, basically has the hereditary condition is the same as what the elephant man has, although that's not the presentation of hers, called neurofibromatosis. It's an autosomal dominant disease. So a number of people in her family have it. And she was taking a tumor suppressor called Embril to deal with psoriatic arthritis. It created a tumor grew 
that turned out, we thought it was going to be a, a lymphoma, which is a cancerous tumor. It turned out, out to be a neurofibroma on the undersurface of her pancreas that was removed in 04. Uh, about the size of your fist, about the size of a softball. When they extirpated it, when they removed it, it, it caused the pancreas to leach, to, 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 be, to create a mechanically induced pancreatitis. I ain't never seen nobody in that much pain. As we say, a mild pain. I mean, she was just double, and there's nothing you can do about it. Just painkillers and fluids, and hope they get better. She went back in the hospital for another week on top of that. Yes, sir. So, uh, why is uh, high liver enzymes associated with Because the liver cells are damaged, and, they're, and effectively, those enzymes are oozing into the bloodstream. When a cell is damaged, we look for products of those cells that leak into the bloodstream where they should. In a heart attack, the heart muscle releases a certain chemical called troponin. Did you study how muscles work? Troponin and tropomyosin? We do that. You probably got a little bit of that in cell and molecule. So we can target the troponin from heart attacks. So we look for that protein. So when liver is damaged, we look for enzymes that would normally be within the liver cells getting excessively into the bloodstream. That is your cell. And that's what we, we always look for that. In the old days, before we could use deutroponin, we did cardiac enzymes serially. We do EKGs over three days and cardiac enzymes over three days to see if they had signs of a heart attack. Now we can do, we can basically identify cardiac troponin and the only way that's going to be in the bloodstream is the heart muscle cells have done. So it's very, we, we can be very specific these days. And so we'll get into the composition of it when we do the physiology, basically alkaline because it's going to neutralize the stomach acid. Lots of these are all basically, these OGENs are like trypsinogen and chymotrypsinogen, procarboxypeptidase, and they're activated went by effectively at alkaline pH in the small intestine. And so here you can see the, the, and then again, this is the single most important anatomical point in your digestive tract. As long as you have this intact, you can eat and drink like a normal person. That was when I had my second GI surgery. That was the first test they did. They did a CT scan to see if that, if my, if my, because what they did was, they removed here. Basically, they took the stomach and created a new opening down here to the jejun. So it was called the jejunostomy. They took this flap off, basically, and basically sealed it, but left this open, so to speak. Almost like folding it down, but effectively left it open. The whole idea was to preserve the common bile duct. Without that, if that had not been preserved, then I would have been basically tube fed for the rest of my life, which probably isn't a great thing. So it's unlikely, given that I had this procedure done in 2000, that I would be doing this lecture today. Aren't you lucky? I'm here. Give this to me. So it's called the hepato, we now call it the hepatopancreatic ampulla liver and pancreas opening, okay, volcano shape, love that, okay, into the duodenum, so it's really distinctive, it's got a sphincter that controls the flow of both bile and pancreatic juice, got a great name, it's called the sphincter, it's proper name of OD, capital O double D-I, okay, there's a little extra duct just in case that helps, so here's the main duct here, this is basically you see this illustration all the time. This is the duodenum or duodenum. It's maybe 10 inches long, barely a foot long, but it's the most critical place in your digestive tract, as I've said. So you can see the, com the coming together of bile, whether it's coming from the liver directly or from the gallbladder, if it's indeed present, and the pancreatic duct, and they join. Down the road, you'll see that the hormones that that the intestine releases are very important. They're called cholecystokinin, 
Cholecysto refers directly to the gallbladder. It induces, it, it does more than this. Its principal role is to squeeze the gallbladder, but it still plays a pivotal role even if the gallbladder is not there to produce bile. It's basically a signal that your gut sends to your, sends to the rest of your digestive tract, hey, food is entering the small intestine. We need stuff to get busy to digest it, process it, and absorb it. Secretin is the, uh, the main chemical that increases the activity in the small intestine. And then, of course, the enterohepatic circulation plays a role into it, et cetera. And you can go through all this, and we'll look at that in physiology. Blah, blah, that's done. And so just a brief introduction for what we're going to do for about an hour this afternoon in the lab is, I, and I'll bring in the exams so you can look at them. And so while, while I'm talking, you can look at them, and, uh, and I'll have those answer sheets. And I'll send you those things to complete. And so you just have to turn in the answer sheet next week. It's not, don't give up yet. I, got, I want to introduce the next thing. Give me two minutes. WCL. What? 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 Please come to our test our next week? Yes. Which one? The lab is here. Thank Catherine. We're going to call her St. Catherine with a K. Can you make them like a cake so we can get out of the lesson? Yeah, what does it take? I have that one. I have to come to you. I also have brownies. We made brownies. We're great. Chocolate covered strawberries. Yeah, I'm not into that. Okay, that's about the extent My wife adores them, however. Okay, well, happy life, happy lifestyle. I can relate to that. Believe me. Everything I do is wrong. Okay. I bring in this item that's worth $100 to sell. Did you put it on the counter where it's dirty? So the box is dirty? That's this morning. You missed it. I would have known. I would have saved some brookie left for you. I hope you made some brownies. Oh. I can see if there's still some more and then I can get them. Yeah, we, 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 did, we did. Hey, we, those Duncan Hines fudge, the box mix, great. Just jazz it up with a bunch of walnuts. I don't mind box mixes for certain. Did you ever make a make a rum cake from the box mix and the vanilla pudding? Oh my God, the bun cake recipe is to die for. Oh yeah, it's it's a classic recipe. It's a rum cake with Duncan Hines yellow cake mix, vanilla pudding mix. I personally like the dark rum, an abundance of butter, and I have I use my bun pan. Well, I, 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 for me, I we don't drink. I was taken aback when we went to the to this place for lunch. My granddaughter, your age, going to be 22 in December, she's ordering a cocktail, and I'm like, okay. Yeah, I mean, she. Well, my son was paying. My wife and I each had a coke. He had a diet coke. So, next time, in very in the next three minutes, we are going to do this. We're going to look at the small intestine. We're going to look at the three parts, which are almost identical, but really the critical piece is coming is here. And that's this. All these anatomical things that increase surface area. It's remarkable. We're going to look at all of these circle, circular folds, which are classically referred to as plica, which means fold, circularity. We're going to look at villi, magic fingers, and they're all those villi are surrounded, all the cells that enclose this finger microscopically have tons of surface area from microvilli. And so that, and this is just a real good look at what they look like. You can see the microvilli that are there. So that's really the next big topic to look at that. And we conclude down the road here by looking at the large intestine. And then we're done with digestive anatomy. There's a lot of physiology, obviously. So let's conclude that here. Are we actually going to look at it like this? No, no, we're not going to look at it. We're not going to open it up. But there's it. Do you know what they do when you're having gut surgery? 